So with Flash Player being removed from web browsers, I was looking for ways I could work around this and hopefully continue the series. First I tried emulators, including one browser extension called Ruffle. This one actually seemed promising as it is able to run some of the Flash content on the site, but so far when it comes to the actual games, I've had no luck. I then thought maybe I could try using an old version of the Chrome web browser or find some alternative browser that still runs Flash Player, but I didn't want to open myself up to the potential security risks, and as well as that, on the 12th of January, Adobe released an update which actually blocks Flash content from running in Flash Player regardless of whether your browser has the plugin installed or not. So that meant web browser options were out of the window. So then I took a look at the latest version of Blue Maxima's Flashpoint, an open source project to archive all Flash content on the internet, and I'm very pleased to report that they seem to have successfully saved every new Neopets game, including some that weren't even available on the website before Flash shut down. After a lot of consideration though, I've decided that this wouldn't be the way to go ahead either. While the overarching goal of this series is to play every game on the website, that's only part of what this show is all about. I also spend much of my time exploring Neopia and interacting with Brightlegs. It's about showcasing an authentic Neopets experience, hence the name of the series. And so if I'm having to play the games on a separate program and I can't even submit my scores or earn Neo points playing them, <laughs> It just wouldn't feel right. So as a final resort, I decided to check out the Neopets beta's very own games room. It's been almost a year since I last checked it out, so I was curious to see what new games had been added. To my disappointment though, I found that only 4 more had been added since, giving a grand total of 11 games. Quite a significant decrease from the over 250 I had at my disposal before. And the 4 new games weren't even new games, they're just games that all already didn't require Flash to function, they might as well have put Potato Counter there. No, the rubbish one. And one of the new games here was disqualified in the first episode because it's a multiplayer game and no one ever hosts. Like ever. Like I'm not even convinced it works. So this is going to be the last episode of the Neopets experience. I think the series has run its course and I'll admit, I missed the deadline for completing it, which was December 2020, the end of Flash Player. Also, I'm not entirely sure Neopets is going to last much longer, even with the them migrating to HTML5, because honestly, they've had a long time to prepare. Flash's impending closure was announced in 2017, and yet they don't have much to show for it. But I want to give the Neopets team the benefit of the doubt. I think they are trying, it's just that they're a relatively small team and maybe they don't have the resources to make a lot of progress quickly, especially given the disruptions of last year. That being said, the website still has a lot of the same issues it's had for a long time. People get locked out of their accounts and their support tickets go unanswered. You have to tweet at them just to get a response. The website has no security certificate. I've been staring at this not secure symbol literally the entire time I've been making this series. No wonder my account got hacked. And most significantly of all, it just feels outdated. You know, it might have been cool in 2008, but in the year 2021, it's just not that fun to feed your pet a virtual omelette by clicking a drop down menu and then pressing submit, and it goes from being hungry to being not hungry. In the very least, it's not that fun to me and that's why I've got to call it here. However, I do still need to tell you about how the Altador Cup went, some interesting things that happened to Brightlegs following it, and of course, check out the last few games. So with that all said and done, let's start the show one last time. Hey guys, Tamago here, and welcome back to the Neopets experience. In the last episode, I left things on a bit of a cliffhanger. Mystery Island had just beaten Team Miraqua 5-1, and we were waiting to discover whether this would be enough to qualify us for the top bracket in the final round. I went to check the results the next day, and yes, Mystery Island had pulled it off, just managing to squeeze themselves into the top 6 with 11 points. Now there would be 5 games remaining against each of the other teams 
teams in the top bracket, starting off with a rematch against our very first opponents, the Darrigan Citadel. The game, however, would not be at all reminiscent of that intensely close first match, as Mystery Island annihilated Tandrok Shea and his entourage, beating them 7 to nothing. I guess some teams come back stronger, and others shouldn't come back at all. Despite the victory on my end, it seemed that the other players representing Mystery Island didn't do so well, probably due to damaging their hands winning at Make Some Noise. And so while Darrigan Citadel moved up to second place, Mystery Island stayed put in sixth, with our next opponents being Bright Veil. This was a harder fought battle due to some stellar goalkeeping by Bright Veil's Ori Danell, but it wasn't enough to stop us from taking home a 3-0 victory. For all it was worth, considering that overall, Mystery Island ended up losing every single game that day and remaining in sixth place. Jesus, okay, maybe we'll have better luck against Kiko Lake, a team made up almost entirely of these M&M looking characters that don't even have legs, as well as goalkeeper Early Quinnock who well, also technically doesn't have legs, I guess you don't need them. Although they might have helped because it was another 3-0 victory for Mystery Island, but would the rankings budge? No, we once again lost in every game that day. I was starting to feel like this was rigged. Our hopes of winning the Altador Cup or even coming in the top three were being shattered before our very eyes. With two matches remaining, could we at least try for a top five finish? Our next next opponents would in fact be the 5th place contenders, Team Krulludor, who despite having some very good plays with a goal following a steal by Zenor Kevix and another corner goal by Clyde Wegg, would still lose 8-2 to Mystery Island. What can I say, we just can't be stopped. Or at least it would appear so before checking the league tables where for the third time in a row, we lost all of the day's games. I couldn't believe it. 126 goals, 22 wins, 0 draws and 0 losses and with no table movement to show for it. Maybe I should have played more slushy slinger. Our final match against Meridel was just a courtesy at this point, and despite beating them 6-1, Mystery Island would not come out on top with another clean sweep defeat that cemented our 6th place position. Despite the terrible luck in the latter rounds of the cup however, I am still incredibly proud of how Mystery Island managed to climb their way into the top division, proving that they are a force to be reckoned with even if this wasn't quite their year. Now out of my own curiosity, I decided to see what would happen if you played a match where neither team scored, so I started a game against the practice team and held on to the ball until the time ran out. Instead of an ending whistle, the referee appeared to be flabbergasted, but I was more confused by the sportscasters who reported the game as being an incredible match with goals traded furiously. I don't know what match they were watching, but I sure would like to see it. So with the tournament completed, all there was left to do was attend the award ceremony and collect our prizes. Kiko Lake came out on top this year, proving you don't need legs to exhibit excellence, and Meridel stood tall in second, with Bright Vale coming in third. My old team, Rue Island, were all the way in 16th place, so I still feel like I made the right decision by ditching them. My performance in the cup this year had netted me 200 196 prize points that I could use to purchase items from the Altador Cup shop, so I decided to purchase a Team Mystery Island gym bag, a championship ring, and a perfectly preserved diamond yu-yu ball, which I was slightly disconcerted by. Is that an ornament or an actual yu-yu trapped in a glass box? With my remaining points, I bought a Shootout Showdown Pro Edition board game and six elegant yu-yu ball fountain pens mostly because they were only one point each. Now with all my tournament swag collected, it's time to take a look at some games. First one we're checking out is Kukia. In this game, Kukiths are overrunning different parts of Neopia and you have to capture them by dragging your mouse over each of them. In order to progress to the next level, you need to collect at least 80% of the Kukiths within a round, and there are bonus rounds too so you can get extra points. At first, I wasn't feeling this game too much because it's not quite as responsive as I would have liked it to be, but once I 
I got the hang of the mouse placement and took advantage of the time control more, I was able to have a much better experience. There's also a boss battle at the end with a mutant Kukith who requires a few clicks to be captured. And finally, there are multiple difficulty levels, giving the game some more replay value. I must say, this one grew on me and in the end, I had a fun time. I'm giving Kukia an 8 out of 10. Following up was Corbat's Lab. This is a pretty standard brick breaker game where you control the paddle to bounce the ball and break the bricks above. Some bricks are harder to break than others and some of them drop power-ups which can help make your job easier. One thing that sets this game apart from others of its kind is the obstacles like the spider and Corbat's which will throw your ball off course if it comes into contact with them. There's also a magic candle which, if purple, allows you to press spacebar to adjust your ball's trajectory for a little added help. Not much to this one, it's not a bad experience, although the obstacles kind of make it more frustrating than challenging since sometimes it was impossible to predict where the ball was gonna go after hitting them. I'm giving Corbat's Lab a 6 out of 10. After that, I played Kujong. This is just Mahjong Solitaire. It's a single player puzzle game that I remember seeing as one of those default Windows games back in the day, but never learned how to play. I wasn't entirely sure what I was doing at first, but after completing a stage, I had a pretty decent idea of what was going on, and I thought the game was alright. I mean, if you're a fan of Mahjong Solitaire, then this is Mahjong Solitaire. Personally, I don't think I'd play it again though even if I could. I'm giving this one a 5 out of 10. Following up was Crops, which is essentially just craps, you know, the casino game, and it is indeed crap, so disqualified. And then there was Kraluden Mining Corporation. In this one, you control a spaceship and have to use your tractor beam to collect the yellow ore and drop it in the refinery. You use the arrow keys to rotate the ship and activate the thrusters. Also, gravity is always pulling the ship down, so my first time playing the game looked like this. That's right, if your ship comes into contact with any surface whatsoever, no matter how gently, it will explode in a fiery blaze. But not just that, if you pick up the yellow ore and then that comes into contact with any surface whatsoever, it and you will both explode in a fiery blaze. But wait, there's more. You also have these nasty cyclops things that shoot bogeys at you. And if these touch you, well, honestly, this game was a challenge. So challenging, in fact, that I got annoyed and just kamikaze the Cyclops out of spite. Look at my attempt to pick up the ore here. That was longer than a Family Guy skit. This is one of those games that's so annoyingly frustrating, it actually becomes kind of fun. Also, I thought the background music was pretty funky, I liked it. Still though, this game had me screaming, ARE YOU KIDDING ME, on a handful of occasions, so I can't be too sure I was enjoying myself. I'm giving Kraluden Mining Corporation a 4 out of 10. It would have been lower, but what can I say, I kind of like the pain. Now I'm sure many of you have been wondering what on earth I was up to between episodes 8 and 9 of the Neopets experience. Was Brightleg starving that whole time? No, I actually kept him fed and looked after every day, although he did have a stint of depression. I'm not joking, Brightlegs was legit depressed, and I can't blame him, 2020 was a tough year. What actually happened was a shadow glided silently past and apparently stole all of Brightlegs' joy, which is such an evil thing to program into a game like this, I need to speak to the manager. In order to cheer him up, I went to the plushie shop and got him this cute Terry plushie. After some bargaining, of course. I gave it to Brightlegs, and he seemed to really appreciate it. But alas, once he was done with it, his depression remained. God damn, top 10 times video games got a little too real, am I right? I gave him a few more toys to play with, but those didn't seem to help all that much either, so I decided to give him some space. A few days later, someone offered to trade Brightlegs for Diet Coke Brightlegs, and honestly, I don't understand why I would possibly say yes to this offer. Brightlegs is an icon, and icons cannot be replicated or replaced. So Blowdry, how about you take your offer and get the hell out of here? 
idiot. A couple of days later, Brightlegs confronted me saying, why don't you just paint me gray if you're gonna leave me like this? And I can't lie. <laughs> That cut me straight to the core. Unfortunately, there's no talk it out or recommend professional intervention option, so all I could do was continue to engage Brightlegs in activities he enjoys. I read books to him, fed him jelly, gave him toys to play with, and eventually his mood went from depressed to miserable. So, you know, uh, improvement? I think? And after spending some more quality time with Brightlegs, he was eventually cheerful once again. Proud of you Brightlegs, ain't no shadow gonna keep you down now is there? Another thing I was up to during the time between episodes 8 and 9 was playing Trudy Surprise every day without fail, which translates to roughly 180 days in a row. Plus, I've been playing it every day since then, and when you total my winnings, along with the profits made from my ripoff receptacle, I have reached a bank balance of over 12 million neo points. That's the power of consistency and compound interest, baby. Yo, bright legs, we're filthy stinking rich. Get your shoes, we going out tonight. I also made a concerted effort to make a collection of the omelets and jelly that you can get for free each day, and I have them proudly displayed in the gallery. So although it was a while between episodes, I was still out here making moves, you better believe it. Now with all that covered, let's go check out one more game, and that is Cast Basher. I remember playing this one a lot back in the day, and was looking forward to seeing if it held up over time. <laughs> Well, the menu screen certainly takes me back. It's hard to forget a theme, so... Piercing. In this game, you play as a Bloomeroo and must try to hit the cast plushie as far as possible. You control when the cast drops from the tree, and the higher the wind speed when it drops, the further it will go, with speeds ranging from negative 9 to 9 meters per second, also indicated by this little flag. The timing with which you hit the cast determines its angle of flight, and once it's in the air, you can control its cape to try and give it some more air time. Additionally, you can click as the cast hits the ground to make it bounce and gain a few valuable extra meters. The last thing which affects the cast's distance is the object you hit it with. You start off with a loaf of bread, but can unlock more effective tools like the stick and baseball bat by hitting the cast distances of 175 and 450 meters respectively. After many attempts, including a few very close ones, I was eventually able to unlock the baseball bat with a distance of 462 meters. It took some adjusting though, since the cast drops from the tree very quickly on this level, but once I got the hang of it, I was able to breeze past my previous record and set a personal best of 986, which for some reason the game saved as 987, but I'm not complaining, I'll take it. And I then proceeded to try to beat that score and maybe even break the 1000 meter mark. Unfortunately, no matter how many attempts I took, I wasn't able to break it, until... <laughs> baited you. For me to pull this off, I needed all the conditions to be just right. I needed the maximum wind speed, I needed to hit it at the perfect angle, I needed perfect air control, and then perfect bounce timing when it hit the ground to gain those precious extra meters. This game had turned from a fun little way to pass the time to a mission of modest proportions. Step 1, maximum speed. Step 2, good angle. Step 3, air control. Good distance. Now for the bounce. 1, 2, 3. Damn it, maximum speed. Good angle. Air control. Glide. Bounce. 1, 2, 3. light work. Cast Basher is awesome, and there's even a rare easter egg that occurs 1 in 10,000 times where you can play with the tree. I've not had the privilege of playing with the tree myself, nor do I intend to play this game that many times in the hopes it happens, but it's pretty funny to look at nonetheless. Cast Basher gets a 9 out of 10, and is the final game of this episode, and quite possibly of the series. So there we have it. We had some good times, some less than good times, and sometimes I'd rather just forget altogether. But overall, it was a great run. In the end, I didn't achieve the goal of playing and reviewing every single game on the website, but with over 125 games covered, 
I can't say I'm too disappointed. I sincerely hope that the Neopets team stays dedicated and takes the feedback of the community on board, so perhaps this doesn't have to be a goodbye, but instead just a see you later. Rightlegs and I have had a great time, we hope you have too, and we thank you for watching The Neopets Experience.